Good afternoon and welcome to this discussion. We're going to talk about leading in adversity, Vanderbilt's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Michael Ainsley, a Vanderbilt trustee emeritus and an alum. I've also had the pleasure of teaching a class this semester on teaching, on uh, focusing on um, leading in adversity. I'm the former president and CEO of Sotheby's. I spent a few years as a director of Lehman Brothers and was also the founding chairman of the Posse Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this very important and timely conversation, which I have had the pleasure of previewing when both of these gentlemen came to speak to my class some weeks ago. <clears throat> During today's discussion, both of them will talk about how Vanderbilt University and Vanderbilt University Medical Center responded to this crisis, how they made decisions as an organization, how they built trust within their communities, and how they bolstered the university and the medical center's reputation as they both were willing to confront these very difficult circumstances. We'll also learn about how their community members worked across both entities to uh, collaborat collaboratively to solve so many complex and big issues. Before we begin today's discussion, let me introduce our two speakers. First, I'd like to welcome Chancellor Deer Meyer. He is an internationally recognized and renowned political scientist and management scholar. Daniel Deermeyer became the ninth chancellor of Vanderbilt University recently. He's also a fellow of the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. He has published four books and more than 100 research articles. Before coming to Vanderbilt, Daniel Deermeyer served in leadership and faculty roles at the Kellogg School of Management, the Stanford Graduate Business School, and as Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy at, at the University of Chicago. From 2016 until 2020, he was the provost of the University of Chicago, where he was responsible for all the academic and research programs across the university and their $5 billion budget. He has been an advisor to governments, nonprofits, and leading companies, mostly in the area of crisis management. <coughs> he has served on the boards of many nonprofits, including and many profit-making profit companies, the technology company CityBase, until its acquisition by GTY Technologies, and interestingly, on the management board of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Today, he's a member of the board of the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, the Field Museum, and the Argonne Labor Laboratory. He's a native of Berlin, Germany, a first-generation college graduate. He earned his PhD from the University of Chicago, uh, University of Rochester, excuse me, in political science, and he holds master's degrees in political science from the University of Munich and in psychology from the University of Southern California. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jeff Balzer, who serves as president and CEO of Vanderbilt University's Medical Center and the Dean of the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He received his MD, PhD in pharmacology from Vanderbilt School of Medicine back in 1990. He then undertook residency and fellowship training in anesthesiology and critical care at Johns Hopkins Hospital and then joined their faculty in 1995. He returned to Vanderbilt as our Associate Dean for Physician Scientist Development in 1998 and soon became chair of the Department of Anesthesiology. He then became the Medical Center's Chief Research Officer in 2004, leading a wonderful period of scientific expansion that moved the university into the top 10 in NIH funding. In 2008, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine, and later that year was named the 11th Dean of the Vanderbilt School of Medicine. 2009, he was also named Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs with responsibility for all health-related programs, including hospitals, clinics, research programs, and the medical and nursing schools. He has led the medical center through a period of remarkable growth, 
That included major inpatient expansion of the Children's Hospital and the adult critical care services. And very importantly, the creation of the Vanderbilt Health Affiliated Network. This is the region's largest multi-state provider network with over 50 hospitals and 3,000 clinicians, all affiliated with Vanderbilt Medical Center. In coordination with the Chancellor and the Board of Trust, Dr. Balzer led the Medical Center through a restructuring in April that ended in April of 2016, which placed the clinicians, the hospitals, the clinics, the research and graduate programs all in a distinct financially independent nonprofit corporation. So it's a pleasure to welcome both of you gentlemen. I think before we start, each of you would like to make a few comments. Chancellor Diermeyer. Well, first of all, thank you very much for joining us today and thank you for the uh, wonderful class that uh, Jeff and I had the pleasure to participate in. And one of the sessions there was uh, wonderful to be part of the discussion and uh, also to reflect back a little bit on the now a little over two years that we have been um, at this. I started uh, in July 1, 2020. Timing is everything. So right <laughs> around when, when things got really serious and I had been involved a little bit earlier already um, after I had been named um, Chancellor of Vanderbilt. And I think one thing that was very quickly clear um, already in March, I would say, is that um, this would be arguably the biggest leadership challenge um, that certainly I had seen in my career so far and, and maybe the biggest one we'll ever face, let's see. And um, it required, I think, a, an approach um, that was really focused on dealing with the particulars of the situation, but also with who we are as a university and with our mission. So one of the most challenging things I think about COVID war is, is, was this profound and persistent uncertainty. Nobody had ever seen this before. We were just beginning to understand the, um, the, the, the characteristics and features of the disease. We had no real treatments at the time. And, so, and we knew that this was going on for a long time. So the challenge was how do you deal really with such profound uncertainty and when where pe people are naturally afraid you know, for themselves, for their loved ones, for their students, for their lives. And um, so what we did very early on, we said, look, we, we can't calculate that. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, facts on the grounds change. We learn more about it. So the way we did it is we said, okay, let's look back to our mission. What's our mission? Well, fundamentally, we're, uh, we are about providing a transformative education for our students and an environment where our faculty can do pathbreaking research. And how do we make every decision that we're going to be engaged in from the point of view of how does it advance the mission? And, uh, and a, critically, a critically important component was for everybody to come together as a community. So I, Jeff and I, we talked about this a lot, that this is something, this is a critical moment where we need to work together to advance our mission. And, I've, and I talked again and again that, that it's easy to be fearful and to freeze in, in light of all this uncertainty, but that what we want to make sure is that we make this our proudest moment so that 30 years, when we look back to this moment, we can say, we as a community really stepped up. No question. Jeff? Well, um, <clears throat> I did have the pleasure of welcoming Daniel to Vanderbilt on a Zoom screen, um, <laughs> because he really did come right at the moment where none of us could actually be together. Um, so that, was, that said a lot, actually, that that's um, the context we were meeting. I think that a lot of my thoughts will come out during the Q&A, but a couple of themes. Um, one is that I think kind of two years, over two years in, and here we are, and things seem like they're getting a little better, and it's possible to reflect. And when I reflect on how we did and what got us through, culture. And, and it's very appropriate that we would be here talking about that together because the culture of the medical center is very much the culture of the university and that's a very old culture mm. that's been nourished by many leaders over many years and we've, we've inherited that responsibility. But I think that had a huge amount to do with how we've done and we can talk about specific examples of that. They're, they're numerous. Um, and it is a reason we were able to work so well together. Um, mm -hmm. 
The other thing I would point to is our innovation capacity, and that's something that the university and the medical center also hold together, but is unusual in healthcare. Um, healthcare systems and academic medical centers at our scale are, are atypical, and, and we're about it for this large region of the Mid-South, and so it, it was both an asset and a responsibility in a sense, because people were really depending on us to do things they knew no one else could do. And um, yet at the same time, I think it was our proudest moment because we were able to work together and do things that were pretty extraordinary and impacted the whole world. So um, I, think, I think it's really a, a very much a story about the university and the medical center doing things um, through our linkages and our common ancestry. Let's talk about communication because that seems to be a critical key. Uh, you talk, both talked about that in our class, about how important it was for the two of you and your two organizations to communicate clearly, early, regularly. Uh, Jeff, why don't you start there? Sure. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, it's pretty common <clears throat> for chancellors to give a lot of public talks and it's just part of the job. <laughs> CEOs of medical centers do some of that, but it's not the first thing we'd have to do when we get up in the morning. Well, boy, did that change <laughs> because just about everybody wanted a piece of me. And it wasn't me so much. It was that the Vanderbilt Medical Center played a role in this community where people really wanted to know what we thought. They were really um, calmed by hearing us say, this is what's real, this is what's not real, this is what's likely to happen. And in many ways, what I realized at the time was we were the trusted voice for this region. Um, and, and so I learned to speak into a teleprompter really well during COVID-19. <laughs> I became really good at it. I'm not a one-take wonder, but I'm, but I'm much, much better than I was when I started because um, at a, there were periods of time where I was doing um, videos for the medical center for the 30,000 people that work for us two or three times a week. And, um, and then Daniel and I would appear together for large audiences in the university community. And so I just think the, the imperative to be visible and to communicate with large groups of people for all of us just became very poignant. Jeff mentioned two, two important aspects of that that, that that really were critical, I think. One was the partnership between, between us, uh, between the university and the medical center and the ongoing communication. I mean, we constantly talked with each other and we also had the great fortune of having some of the best experts in the world on these types of issues. And we, we, the lines of communication were, were open all the time. And then the second aspect was the capacity for innovation. Yeah. And so we learned very, very quickly that uh, very similar to your experience is that video messages can be very impactful. Uh, we also used um, very early on town halls um, where we would have um, Zoom calls with, um, for example, parents or incoming students that were very concerned and wanted to know about uh, you know, what our decision would be um, for the next year. So the ability to communicate in new ways, I think, was essential. I'll just mention one little, tiny little example. So um, I was so proud of the work that, that our community was doing throughout this time. And, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I had many moments when I knew that our staff was really doing extraordinary things. We asked them to do extraordinary things, and they did. And in one of these instances, um, uh, I... I, uh, I thought, you know, I, I, wanna, I need to connect with them more. I want to thank them, but I, you couldn't do it in person. Right. So I created, I, I did this little thing which I called management by Zoom bombing, where I basically would show up in their, in their uh, get-togethers via Zoom, and mostly I would, I would thank them for their work and, you know, encourage them, and just, you know, we had a little discussion on that, and those were some of the most moving moments for me during this whole pandemic because you could feel in the moment how much people were contributing, how much they were stepping up, how much they were really focused on making sure that our, our faculty, our staff, our students could do their work and could advance our mission uh, in a sense that uh, was 
was really reflective of who we are and the culture that you were talking about, Jeff. You know, one of the things that came out in our class discussion uh, from our students was the good trust and communication and friendship that the two of you have. Uh, that happened quickly because you were very new on the job, Chancellor. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about that. And, and I think trust is a really key word. You used it earlier, Jeff, about the community's trust in the medical center. Yeah. Talk a little bit about trust because that's critical in all of this. I, I couldn't agree more. And we, we became fast friends under fire. Yeah, yes. Because uh, <laughs> we, it, it, was, it was incredible. Everything was kind of accelerated because we had to make so many decisions together. And yeah. um, we spent a lot of time on that. And Jeff was just invaluable as, like a, as a trusted expert. So we had him in our board meetings. We had him in like, um, these uh, webinars that we were doing. And he, he, you know, he was able to communicate with people that were worried, that were concerned, but with a sense of authority and, and expertise that was just really crucial. And then we had to just make many, many um, operational decisions, some together, some on our own, where like having this partnership uh, with, the, with the medical center and the relationship that Jeff and I developed very quickly was just invaluable. Yeah, it was, it was critical. You know, the other thing that, that was great for Daniel and I is he's, we, we both know a lot, but we know different things. It, you heard during his bio, he's actually an expert in crisis management. That right? came in handy. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, how perfect is that? So, exactly. um, and you're right, an emergency right? <laughs> and by the way, crisis management in healthcare. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, what a, what a gift. And so um, it was like a built-in consult. So I, I really valued being able to call him up and say, hey, what do you think about this? And, mm -hmm. that, and, and the other thing is there's, you know, sort of a what can I do to help you, mm -hmm. which is an old part of our culture. It's almost like um, this is a chancellor who was meant to be here because... Um, he actually lives what we think we are and what we want to be in his day-to-day -day routine and in the way he interacts with people. Let's that go, made a huge difference. Let's go deeper there. This is your uh, field of, of study and expertise. Mm -hmm. How did that help you and in what ways were you prepared for this and, and what, was, what were some of the ways it was able to be used? Well, so there were some aspects where I think it was very helpful. And uh, you mentioned communication, for example. So. Uh, there are, we, under, we know from the research on this, is that, um, that there are factors that enhance trust and um, you know, transparency and a sense of you know, expertise and uh, a sense of like a commitment and also what I mentioned before, to be able to be empathetic and connect with people. And, um, and, I, and, and, and so we were very clear that we would utilize this as much as we can. There's also, um, there's also, we understand that fear that people have is not always um, highly determined by the objective realities, but when things are particularly uncertain or novel, people become just more fearful and are more concerned. So these were all aspects that, that we thought about very carefully. Um, and then there were other things I think that were helpful, which was um, how do we think about decision making during these situations? Mm -hmm. um, so and there, were, there were principles that we stuck to that were, I think, really crucial. Um, one such principle was make a decision when you have to, but not earlier. So because there was so much uncertainty and things were changing so rapidly, making a decision later is often very helpful because the facts on the ground change, you learn more, and you learn more what others are doing. So we were very intentional about that. That wasn't always easy to communicate because People want answers, and they don't like to be in a state where there's uncertainty. But we would tell them, for example, on the question as like when, when or whether we would invite students back on campus, that on a particular time we would make that decision, that we had maximal time to think it through <coughs> and incorporate the information. So those were things that were on the decision process, on kind of principles on the communication, where having been in similar situations before was very valuable. But there were also things that were new. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, th things where we just had to, I love the point, innovative capacity, the use of technology. Mm -hmm. And how do you work together 
right, in a, effectively as a team when you can't be in the same room. That was, that, that I think was done surprisingly quickly. And then we just adapted these new, tech, both of us uh, adopted these new communication technologies, I think, rather, very rapidly. And then, of course, the challenge is, how do you do this over two years? Right? How do you make sure you stay together and the sense of fatigue and the sense of disappointment and these kind of false hopes? That was unique. I mean, I, I, I certainly have never seen anything like that before. And, uh, and it required us, I think, to dig deep and come up with solutions that we didn't think uh, we, we didn't think about before, and sometimes I think resources that we didn't really thought we had in us. And we're still at it. And we're still at it. <laughs> you spoke about the decision to bring students back to campus. Uh, I think Vanderbilt distinguished itself mm -hmm. in this regard. Many, many of our competitive peer universities shut down, yeah. sent the students home, uh, really, really, uh, I think they forgot their mission, frankly. <laughs> uh, Talk about this, because I think this is distinguishing for Vanderbilt. Yeah, we were, so everybody had to shut down in March, March 2020. There was just no, one, no other way around, and it was very difficult for our students. It was very difficult logistically. <clears throat> and then the question was, very quickly, what are we going to do next academic year? And um, uh, we, we thought about this very carefully, as I said before. Uh, we made the decision when we had to, but not earlier, but we, after extensive analysis um, in terms of like where we can house students, where, how, how would this all work with the way finding the classrooms, physical distancing, we came to the conclusion that we can do it. And we then decided that we would invite all our students back. Um, we had 85% of our students back on campus. The students that were unable to join us were mostly international students that couldn't get visa during mm -hmm. that time. And um, it was a Herculean effort to make this work. But it was driven by our mission. And our mission was, as I said before, transformative education. And we strongly believe that that happens best in a residential environment. So our sense, we never, con we never conceptualized it on should we go online or should we do in person. Because once you do that, it's easy to say we're going to go online. Mm -hmm. We said, what's the best way to advance our mission? That means bringing our students back and then how do we do this as safe as we possibly can in this environment of COVID-19? And uh, that required an enormous effort from our, from our staff, but we always were focused on the mission because we strongly be believe in residential education. We think that's, a, that's the source of the transformative education that we provide. And just to say one last point on that, we did the same on the research side. So on the research side, that meant for us, of course, the labs were closed. And we decided that uh, in order to be able to allow our faculty to do their work, we needed to have the labs open as quickly as possible. And with physical distancing, that meant we could only have run them at a capacity of one third. We had them open, back opening and within six weeks. And our faculty or students worked in the labs around the clock, 24 hours. They brought beds in, they slept there. And the very breakthroughs that you heard about COVID that happened right here at the medical center and at the university, the first antiviral treatments, antibody therapies, the clinical trials, they all had their roots in our faculty basically coming together, working around the clock in order to advance their research, which had this tremendous impact on our fight against COVID. Jeff, continue that conversation about the, uh, the, what the contributions to the global solutions and, and uh, treatments have been. Yeah, I'd be happy to, happy to do that. Um, so the, <clears throat> the innovation capacity, um, you know, you're building it for years and years. You, you wonder sometimes, is this all going to be um, understood, right? And so the best example I can think of is Dr. Mark Dennison. Yeah. So Dr. Mark Dennison was, um, had trouble getting his grants because nobody thought coronavirus was important. Hmm. And... <laughs> Well, one of the only reasons we know this is a, is a writer at, um, at the New York Times, Gina Collada, in, the, in May of the first May of the pandemic, wrote an article about Mark Dennison saying, did you know <laughs> that no one thought this, that his work was important? And now we had the first antiviral that was actually shown to, to have clinical use in COVID-19, Redesivir, 
Mark did all the preclinical work on that drug and his collaborators. So, you know, it, it just is, for me, it, it teaches you a lot of things. It teaches you about, you know, there's the obvious things that innovation capacity do normally at steady state, companies forming, tech transfer, the things we're all aware of. But there's this other piece to innovation capacity that it's almost like you're building, you're storing away acorns for the winter. Mm. And there are times when things you never thought you'd need, but places like universities and academic medical centers are the reservoir for that knowledge and it saves us. And I feel like that's what happened. Um, because it wasn't just Mark Dennison, it was Jim Crow and all these other infectious disease immunology experts. We have the first monoclonal antibody um, that's approved for use worldwide for treatment, for prevention of COVID-19 in people who are immunosuppressed. Worldwide, that's like 100 million people, right? Oh. So who knew, right? <laughs> but, um, but, but it's remarkable. Let me add one little piece to that, Michael. Mm -hmm. I think uh, just to highlight something what Jeff just said, I think when you are in these types of situation, um, there's a sense where you're going to be prepared, and that's both the capacity that you have and the way you're thinking about it, but there's almost always something that you didn't think about that's new. <laughs> and I think the ability to innovate under pressure is really critical. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a, you have to have the right people, you have the right, have the right infrastructure, the right capabilities, but you also have to have the right culture to make that work. And sometimes the pressure helps you. Yeah. Now you, you both made some important early decisions about uh, staying open, staying, keeping your employees, not doing furloughs like a lot of major universities did and a lot of major medical centers. Talk about those decisions and what sure. that built in terms of trust from your employees and the broader community and some of the benefits that came out of it. Well, for us, it was really something because, you know, if you recall the spring of 20, um, virtually all what they call elective, they're not really elective, scheduled health care. Mm. Um, elective is a really bad term because people think elective surgery is plastic surgery. Mm. Elective well, surgery deferable. is open <laughs> heart surgery if you scheduled it. <laughs> right? So, um, so we were canceling that wow. right, in, in spring of 20. And so people that understand the economics of healthcare know the, the procedural work that medical centers do not only pays for the procedures, it actually cross funds everything else we do. Mm. And so, you know, this medical center was hemorrhaging a couple hundred million dollars a month. A month? That's yeah. a lot of money. That's a lot of money to be losing. And we were not alone. All of our peers were in exactly the same situation. It was very scary. And we we're all looking at each other wondering how long we can sustain it. And so what practically all medical centers did was, well, we just have to lay people off temporarily. So we would, they would furlough people, but they'd stop paying them in the middle of a pandemic where people are losing their jobs right? Or they would basically lay off staff. They would cut pay. They would cut benefits. This went on nationwide. And we all looked at each other and said, you know, we're going to need more nurses in about four months when we have our surge. And when all these other hospitals in the region are closed, we're going to be it. So we better staff up. And what we also said was, you know, if you have a structural deficit that you believe is going to be forever, you probably have to ratchet down the size of your organization to deal with that. But financial reserves are for temporal disturbances, and maybe we should use them. <laughs> and so, so we made what I think was actually a cultural decision in the end, which is what we started talking about a, a several minutes ago, right? Culture drove us to say, we're just not going to do it that way. And we hired 2,000 nurses from all the hospitals in the region that were laying people off and staffed up. 
and we paid everybody at prior year levels. So nobody took a pay cut, nobody, and it was really interesting because, you know, two years later when we're all dealing with workforce shortages, right, and morale problems, and we have our share of those, but I got to tell you, there are a lot of people that remember what happened in April and May of 2020. And they're staying with us because they remember that. And it makes me really happy. Great. What, what did you do in the, in the university, Daniel? V very similar challenges. Um, so in the spring of 2020, um, the bottom fell out from university finances. Uh, certainly at Vanderbilt, but really every one of our peers. So our endowment lost about a third of its value. Um, we, were, we were very worried about tuition. Uh, we were worried about grants. And then on top of that, we had, um, you know, we had tremendous expenses um, in terms of like protective equipment and so forth. So this was the biggest, this was the biggest threat um, and impact on our finances that we, that we know, that we, that we can, that we can look back at in our history. So this happened across the board. And many of our peers did something very similar to what Jeff was describing at other hospitals. So they would do mass layoffs, they would cut benefits. Um, and benefit cuts, that's basically, you know, a pay cut by another mean. It's like, you know, 12, whatever it is, 10 to 12 percent impact. Um, and we looked at that and we were in a fortunate position that uh, thanks to my predecessor, Nick Zeppes and Susan Venti, um, we had reserves. And so we said, you know what, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this together as a community. We're going to avoid mass layoffs. We're going to avoid mass furloughs. And we will not cut people's benefit. We will not give anybody a raise. So we, no, nobody at the university got a raise. And so we really looked at this as a shared sacrifice that we would do as a community. That was the first piece. The second piece, um, became clear very quickly. And the way this works in universities, there's budget season in April and May. And a budget uh, season in April and May, of course, was heavily influenced by everybody's experience of the dramatic financial impact of the pandemic. So many of our peers decided that next year, which is the fall of 2020, they wouldn't hire anybody. They wouldn't, certainly wouldn't hire staff, but they also wouldn't hire faculty. So we looked at that and we said, well, Everybody's suffering, but they'll suffer more. So there's still fantastic young research faculty that are looking for a job, but there's nobody to hire them. So we thought, perfect opportunity for us to bring new talent to Vanderbilt. So we did the, we did the math, we looked at it, and we said, we're going to have a, we're going to actually not only continue to bring new faculty to Vanderbilt, but on top of that, we're going to bring in more. So if you're the law school, and usually you want to hire one faculty member, but there are three excellent faculty members available right now, hire all three, and we, Chancellor's Office, will cover the extra headcount until things are bad and back in equilibrium. So we called this program Destination Vanderbilt. It's a $100 million investment targeted to bring around 60 new faculty to Vanderbilt, and it was enormously successful. We've never seen anything like it because these were great faculty looking for a home, and Vanderbilt provided it. So in computer science alone, we hired 10 people um, last year. Computer science is very, very difficult to hire, but we were a great destination for incredible talent. And I think this will, this will really pay benefits um, for, for years, maybe even decades to come. So I want to say one more thing on that because I was in some of the meetings. It's a, it, it, it's, this is a critical moment for a board as well. Mm -hmm. and, and whether you're the CEO of a, of a medical center or whether you're the president or chancellor of a university, during moments like that, you need the support of your board. And there needs to be a relationship of trust. And there also needs to be a sense that whether we're, we're, well, you'll, you'll talk to the board and you basically say, OK, this is what we want to do. There's real risk here. Can't eliminate that because the bottom may fall out even more than what we have <coughs> right now. But we think this is the right move. This is the right approach to move the university or the medical center forward and our boards, well, I don't want to talk about your board because I'm on it, but my board it's was true. fantastic. Well, they were fantastic. They were totally supportive. They got it. They were comfortable with the level of risk. Of course, we had, you know, contingency plans and all of that, but, but the board, I mean, I had like weekly calls with the board. I had 
some case daily calls with my chair, they were totally part of that. And then again is something that you can't just create from scratch. That's the culture and that's relationships and relationships of trust that you have to rely on when it really matters. Well, this is about leading in adversity and both of you have just given beautiful stories about tough, really uh, difficult decisions that went against the grain. Yeah. No other universities or medical centers were doing these things. And you uh, had the vision and the, and the courage to go to your boards and do these things. So kudos. Uh, Jeff, you told a story that was fascinating to our class about telemedicine, yeah. how you <laughs> took a five-year plan and made it a three-year plan, a three-week plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell that story. It's really wonderful. Sure. Well, and I tell it in the context of trust, which is something we've been talking about. So, and I made a brief comment that, you know, we, we have this amazing innovation capacity and that's really helped us, but sometimes a crisis actually makes us work it better. Mm. And so this was a perfect example. So some of you may know Vanderbilt has this incredible deep rich history around informatics, the design and all the innovation around electronic health records. The first electronic health record in America was rolled out uh, as, as a complete hospital system at Vanderbilt in the mid-1990s when no one even knew what one was. George Bush came to Vanderbilt to announce the nation's health IT initiative. So we have all this rich history. And so if any place could do telehealth, which is really a health information technology play because the tele part is just a video. Um, anybody could do it, we could do it. So I was adamant that we needed to have telehealth capability and that this was going to be the future. And my folks had this really aggressive five-year plan <laughs> to get telehealth working. It was going to be so hard. There's legal issues, the financial billing, Oh, and of course, the patients are going to hate it. Would the patient accept it? The patients are going to hate it because doctors were so warm and fuzzy, right? <laughs> so then in March of 20, it became really clear that there were about a million people that were going to get no care mm. unless we could do this. And these were patients, the Vanderbilt University Medical Center manages patients who are with us partly because no one else can take care of them. Mm. And so these people really need us in an interactive way all the time, and we had to be able to communicate with them. So um, we got it done in three weeks. Three weeks instead of five years. Yeah, so, <laughs> and honestly, a lot of it was okay. You know, any, any disciplinary organization it's true in all corporations, there are guilds. The law guild, the finance guild, the blue suits, the white coats, and those historic views cause less trust than there could be sometimes. But when everybody's scared and everybody has to come together in the room and really get to know one another and make something happen, it's amazing how all that can be overcome so quickly. And so I actually think it was the combination of anxiety and fear as well as really bringing people from different disciplines together in an intense way that made this possible. And there are other examples. Telehealth isn't the only one, right. but I love to tell that story because it's so prototypical. So dramatic. Yeah, it's dramatic. Is it, is it sticking? Are we gonna continue with this method of delivering? Well, and in fact, we are, and in Tennessee, the Tennessee legislature and the governor just signed a bill to make um, telehealth reimbursement permanent. Mm, great, great. So we're thrilled about that. And it means we can continue to expand because even today under normal circumstances, there are so many rural areas in Tennessee where specialty care is almost impossible for people to get. And now we can deliver it. Mm. Um, we talked about the fact that you have to make decisions without good information in this kind of a pandemic. I think, uh, Chancellor, you even said that if you hit four out of five decisions are the right ones, that's a pretty good batting average. Um, however, I'm sure you had pushback and differing viewpoints. 
Talk about some of the, how you dealt with some of those and who maybe some of those uh, differing viewpoints came from and, and how you dealt with them. So, absolutely, and uh, this was uh, certainly a period where lots of people had points of views and lots of people had strong opinions. And um, I'll give you the example of athletics um, where um, we made a decision that went totally against the grain. Yes. And um, so um, the Ivy League, for example, decided very early on in August already um, to uh, permanently suspend all athletic competitions for the year. And there were many in our community that said, well, you should do the same thing. You should follow what the Ivies are doing. And we looked at it and we went back to our mission and our purpose. And that is, when we think about our students and our faculty, is to allow them to realize their fullest potential. And that means that if you are working in a lab as a biochemical engineer, that's, you gotta have to have a lab to do that. And if you are a young musician at the Blair School, and you wanna practice your oboe, we need to find a way for you to practice your oboe as much as we can. And for our student athletes, that means, that meant for us, if, if we can make it possible for our student athletes to compete in a as safe environment as we can provide it, we're gonna bend over backwards to make this possible. And the amount of difficulty and challenges to get through that was really incredible. We did it together with our colleagues in the SEC. There was a lot of challenges, a lot of pushback. The relationship with uh, the physicians and the physician scientists in the medical that was invaluable because we could look at the analysis. What's the risk to the athlete? Is it a bigger risk if you're on the football field than when you are in a classroom how does that work? Well, we looked through the analysis and we said, you know what? We can do this. Um, we can do this. It will take an enormous amount of effort, protocols and testing and this and that and the other, but we can do it. And then, and then um, we had to put processes in place so that our athletes were protected. But you know, if they wanted to compete, we would make it possible for them to compete. And every one of our teams competed. And uh, those athletes that didn't want to compete, they got an extra year of eligibility and scholarships so that they could decide freely. Um, now, you, now, the amount of media scrutiny you have doing that is just off the charts. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm extremely proud of how we did this together with, with our colleagues in the SEC. The leadership of the commissioner was really critical. But I think the general thing you learn from that is that What's your purpose? What's your mission? Do the best you can in terms of the analysis. And then you have to be comfortable that there's residual risk. And to what you said, you know, getting four or five wrong is pretty good. Uh, that's just a reality. Four out of five, right. Yeah, that's four <laughs> or five wrong is not so good. We've got to remember <laughs> that. Four or five right is pretty good. But there is, there is you, you only, I think, able to really advance your mission and advance the university or the medical center if you, if, there's, if you take some chances. There's no other way to do it. Other than that, you're not growing, you're not advancing. And so we, we knew that. You want to know what you're, you want to know, you know, what's the residual risk that you're, that you're taking if you want to create an environment where your faculty and your students can thrive. But at the end of the day, you have to, you have to be comfortable with that. And they were comfortable with that. I mean, the telehealth is a great example of that, something completely new. In the case of athletics, we were comfortable with that. But at the end of the day, if you are, I think, in these situations, if you're too conservative, you're actually not serving your mission either. And so getting this balance right is hard, it's tricky, um, but at the end of the day, I think it's what's required to really serve the purpose of the organization. Well, you're on athletics before Jeff uh, weighs in on some of his um, naysayers. Um, you also made an early decision about an athletic director. Yes. Even before you officially were in the job. Yes. And I think that was frankly one of the really good decisions you made early on. Yeah. So this was my first. This was my first unofficial appointment because I was not really in the seat yet, and I did it together with the uh, our interim chancellor Susan Venti at the time. But we had uh, um, we needed to appoint a new athletic director, and we uh, picked Candice Lee. Candice Lee, you know, first African-American woman to be the athletic director in the SEC. And um, it was a, you know, it was, it was, when you appoint an athletic director, there's always a lot of scrutiny. 
and uh, there's a lot of people that passionately care about uh, Vanderbilt athletics. And so, you know, people were people were, were questioning, you know, why did you pick Candace? Why not somebody <laughs> else? But it comes back to some of the themes that we've highlighted. I wanted to have somebody that really understood this university, that was totally aligned with our purpose and our mission. Candace and I always talk about when we say there's not an inch of daylight between us. And, you know, I firmly believe in the role that college athletics can play if it's done the right way and if it's connected with the values that we all share. And she has that. She has that. She lives there. You know, she has three degrees from Vanderbilt. She's a triple door. She totally understands that. And she can communicate it in an authentic fashion because that's her story. And that's what I wanted for athletics. I wanted, I wanted to make sure that we have athletics our way in, in a way that is the right fit for this university, its values, its mission, its purpose, and having Candace available to step up to this challenge was just, was just a, a great stroke of luck. And what does she do but go out and recruit probably the most desirable woman's basketball coach in the country? Yes. To come in from Connecticut, right under Gino's nose, <laughs> head our team, and she's already turning it around. She's already doing that. You know, we have a we have a we have a fantastic new football coach. We have a fantastic new women's basketball coach, and there is, I think, a sense of energy right now and a sense yeah. of of momentum here that, that that's infectious. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're we're very pleased with uh, with the leadership that that Candace is bringing to us. Jeff, one department. of your uh, comments was that uh, you're one of your toughest audiences was. Uh, your doctors mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of uh, challenging some of where you were trying to take them. Talk a little, you talked a little bit about it in telemedicine, but... Yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the key to um, getting people on the bus in a medical center um, kind of goes to the heart of the whole quality and safety issue. So um, the way quality and safety really works in today's world is, um, is understanding that delivering safe care is all about the system, that individuals do impact that quality and safety, but fundamentally most errors are system errors. Mm. And so what we've learned, and this goes back to the Quality Chasm Report of the National Academy of Medicine years ago, is that systems that are able to speak up, where speaking up is encouraged, actively encouraged, and people don't feel they'll be penalized for saying, hey, what's that? Are you sure you mean that? Mm. Um, succeed and, and are safer. And so I think, fortunately, Vanderbilt University Medical Center is a place that really believes that and lives that and has lived it for years. And so I think we were able to draw on that so that we were able to permit conversations about whether we should, you know, wear masks in a certain area under this condition or not, or, you know, because as you know, the guidance from the government has been varied and hard to apply in specific geographies based on the conditions on the ground. So medical centers like ours really did have to make some of their own decisions based on what reasonable people thought. And so we really, I think, were able to succeed not because we were top down, but because we were able to have people feel heard but then we did make a decision. And people would follow that decision because they felt heard, not necessarily because we agreed with all of them. Mm -hmm. So, Sometimes uh, periods of adversity uh, can lead to areas that you can improve in other parts of the organization beyond the crisis moment. Talk a little bit about the future and what some of the decision-making processes or technologies that you've observed or developed, how can this help Vanderbilt and the Medical Center going forward? Well, I think um, I love to talk about kind of <clears throat> what's the takeaway. And, and I actually think it's less about technologies than understanding that 
this trust we build with the public around meeting their needs mm. is what really sustains the healthcare system. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> there are all kinds of reasons why the vaccination rates in the United States are not as high as they need to be, and Tennessee is no exception. In fact, it's somewhat worse here than many states. And yes, some of that is because vaccination has been politicized. But let's put that aside, because what we, we know, but we don't really want to admit, is that some of it's because people don't trust the healthcare system. Mm, right. Right. Now, there was a time mm. when people really did trust the healthcare system. But that has eroded for the last 40 or 50 years. And part of it is that people don't feel we provide very good service. Mm. You know, you can't get an appointment. You wait in the waiting room. The parking mm. is terrible. Mm. If you've had a loved one who's got a chronic disease, trying to get all three of their appointments in the same week can mm. be a nightmare. You know, so there are all these service issues that we've been very slow to attend to. Mm in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we managed to do during the pandemic was solve some of those problems for people under the urgent circumstance. Mm. And they really appreciated it. And we saw a surge in that trust. Mm. And I think what we're learning is that, you know, really focusing on people's service needs isn't just about getting more market share or getting more patients, it actually is one of those acorns you store away for when you need them to trust you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and it's just like great companies in America that give great service are trusted brands. I think the same thing's true for healthcare. So I think one of our takeaways is really, really trying to build trust with patients by meeting their needs as opposed to having them organize their lives around how we'd like to work. Mm -hmm. I think that's really insightful and important. Chancellor, what about the so university? So we there there's a lot about decision making processes, there's a lot about technology, lots of lessons that we take with it. But to me the most powerful is really how do we take this experience that we all went through for the last two years and and use it productively as we move forward. And at the time when we communicated, when we talked about that, we asked people to make this their proudest moment, something that they really can look back to, you know, with a sense of accomplishment that they left a legacy here. And I'm ex extremely proud of what we came, what we did as a, as a community to step up to these challenges. But there are also lessons I think you can take now to move forward. And, and to me, the main lessons are that number one, if we are dealing with these challenges, if we come together as one community, we can move mountains. And let's never forget that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, the, and that was such a powerful experience during the last two years. And then the second one is, along many of the things that Jeff has been talking about, we can operate at a higher level of metabolism. We can be faster, we can be more agile, um, we can make chances, we can learn more quickly, we can do things that we thought would take five years and three weeks. Let's not lose that. Let's take that with us. And then the last aspect that I would say, we can be authentically our own. I think sometimes we look too much over our shoulder and worry about what others are thinking about it, other universities, other parts of the country. We can proudly be our own and focus on what, what's unique about us, what makes us, what makes us special, follow our own North Star, and then act accordingly. And whether that was to in athletics or bringing the students back or telehealth or all the type of specific decisions were fundamentally driven by a sense of who we are. And I, want, I really want people to take that with them so that, that we don't lose that, but take it into the next chapter of writing in that, that, that we want to write together. Give an example of, of, of the decision making being rapid and responsive. I wrote you about this course, <laughs> Managing in Adversity, an email in late October <clears throat> And two days later, you said, do the course. Uh, Vanessa Beasley will help you get it launched. And she made me an adjunct professor the next week. And we've had 30 leaders, thought leaders from around the world in the country. Our last was the head of Islamic studies yesterday from American University talking about managing an adversity in Pakistan wow. in his past. 
And that happened in 24 hours, 36 hours, because you said, do it. Uh, you did the same thing with uh, Candace Lee. You moved fast. We had a crisis, and you needed to do it. You've done it already with athletics and the support you've given it and the hiring decisions you all just outlined. I think that's critical, because universities are known for slow, slow, slow action and decision making. And that can and should change, and it is, it seems to me. So I think this has been a wonderful discussion. I want to thank both of you for your uh, time and for sharing this with the Vanderbilt community. Uh, we are fortunate to have leaders of your quality, and, and now you're even more experienced in crisis management. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, we Michael. We hope you all thank have you. enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you.